everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, it's been uh, a real pleasure over the last uh, four years that our shop has been around to, to get to know a number of people who, who work in the comic book industry and obviously at all different levels. And I'm very happy that uh, Tracy has been a part of that extended family of local creators and he has continued to be so very good to us as a store and coming in and helping out with events and doing signings uh, from the very first day. So um, a big heartfelt thanks from me uh, to, uh, to you and for participating. And uh, one thing that honestly was a, a huge blind spot for me uh, when it comes to comic books uh, really was a lot of the licensed property comics. I came into it, not everything's kind of a licensed property in a bigger sense, I guess. Yeah. I came to it through the ones that, you know, your traditional superhero comics. But with licensed comics, and in this case I'll talk, we'll talk, obviously we'll dive into Sonic the Hedgehog, and we'll dive into, you know, maybe some of the ancillary, like even things like Cosmo that you've worked on that is an is a intellectual property owned by somebody else. But what was your introduction really to comics as a as a young person what do you remember really gravitating toward and being like oh i enjoyed this well when i was a little kid um as i i think i answered somebody else before what i did like how would i get into comics you know like as a child i always enjoyed cartoons you know i grew up in the 80s when there was all those classic cartoons that we still have comics and, <laughs> and toys and stuff on now we transformers do. duck tales all that kind of stuff really yeah i would say as a child i was really more in animation uh, the comics specifically. I uh, didn't really read a lot of comics outside of uh, like the newspaper strips and things yep. like that. I was always a huge fan of you know Garfield and uh, you know I, of course when I saw Calvin Hobbes, it was fantastic. You know he collected all those books when I was in like middle and high school. He's stuff. up to his one hundred and seventy eighth book. <laughs> That Garfield? Oh, is he? Because <laughs> <laughs> they always put the numbers on the front, sure. and not just on a number. It's like his 178th book, <laughs> I think, is what just came out. And yeah, it's insane. Yeah, there's a great, there's a great podcast um, called "I Hate Mondays," where there's this couple and they review every single comic strip starting from the 70s. <laughs> oh my God, this is now going to be my obsession. So yeah, you should look that up. Um, oh, I had a Garfield like whole section of my room growing up that was <laughs> oh, the yeah. plushies, the watch, the phone where you pulled sure. his back off and yeah. talked into his I'm back. I'm sure, I'm sure we had a Garfield <laughs> plush. But anyway, um, yeah. yeah, like even, even when I went into, uh, uh, you know, in middle school and high school, I'd draw little comic strips, you know, strip style mm. things, you know, and I, kind of intended to to go into that as a profession you know, with SCAD and all I, I focused a lot on that kind of thing uh, but I mean the entire industry of newspapers is really not really a thing like it used to be um, in some ways it's a lot better because uh, in the olden days you would have to get a contract through uh, one of a very few two or three uh, syndicate companies you know and then they would yes uh, distribute your strip into papers and it's like the odds of that happening is like being a movie star and a rock star combined you know <laughs> so I uh, really and I'm you know I don't think I have quite the sense of humor to do a joke a day you know and I'm sure a lot of those comics aren't really funny every day, but you know. You know <laughs> well, Jim Davis, you know. I, I'm pretty sure, has not drawn a comic strip in 30 years sure, or sure, longer. Sure. Yeah, he's got a team of people, yeah. you know, like late night TV joke writers. But, uh, and that's, you know, to digress a little bit, you know, people always ask about the money side of comics and things. And it's like, you know, in comic books, uh, of course, you have your superstars like Adam Hughes or Jim Lee or whoever. And there's, you know, a tiny handful of those kind of people who can command a lot of money for their work probably from just drawing comics yeah. but also at conventions they get paid to be there and they have huge commission fees and stuff like that but they're they're really really far few, few and far between very rare um you know your average joe working in comics doesn't really make a lot of money and um uh that a lot of those comics like garfield and things that all comes from merchandise you know it's where most people like jim davis or charles schultz peanuts you know Everybody knows them, but they also mostly know it from <laughs> cartoon shows and party hats and plates yeah, and, you yeah. know, and yeah, plush dolls and t-shirts and things. So, you know, if you can come up with an idea that's marketable, it might spin off into merchandise and that's where you're going to make your money. Um, so when you were in high school, when you were at that point, you know, not yet in college, not yet chosen a career track, 
was there like a character or a strip design or some sort of a concept that you like were working on and were really passionate at that point? Not really specifically, no. I mean, uh, well, probably Sonic the Hedgehog was one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't really plan specifically to do comics. Uh, but as I've told the story many times, you know, I was, a, I was a fan of Sonic from the day one. You know, I saw the old... Genesis games in the electronics boutique in the mall, you know? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I just fell in love with it. My brother got a Genesis for Christmas one year, but I kind of commandeered it and made it my own. <laughs> Younger brother or older brother? <laughs> my twin brother. Oh, fantastic. Fraternal, yeah, yeah. fraternal twin. Yeah, yeah, look yeah. alike, but uh, uh, yeah, we were a little spoiled that year. He got a Genesis, I got a TurboGrafx-16, which I also yeah. enjoyed. Bonk, uh, man. Bonk, yes. It was almost Bonk like watching a cartoon. Yeah. I mean, for back then, it was totally as close as you were going to get. Yeah. <laughs> so, um... So you kind of were doing, I mean, what we would call now fan art or whatever. You oh. were drawing Sonic and drawing all these other kind of, you know, pop culture. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was definitely a commercial style artist, you know, like, uh, that's like my, I was very, very um, fortunate to have, you know, nobody in my family ever said, ah, you can't do that or you won't make any money doing that or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and my teachers in middle and high school were always very supportive of what I did. You know, they would, took my project seriously you know um and yeah definitely like uh in high school my our teacher you know, would, would refer to myself as commercialistic but that's fine you know and it yeah. is and definitely is you know and, um um but yeah most of my project would kind of center around video game care mario or sonic or something you know things like that not always but when i had the opportunity to work that in there and um you know and then uh i was lucky to have uh Counselors at school that came across the SCAD uh, book that they yeah. sent around to high schools, you know, and they pointed it out to me. So I thought, oh, that's perfect. You know, they've got a what they call sequential art <laughs> comic book uh, course there at the school. So I, I was like, well, that's what I'm going to do. So <laughs> Yeah. At that point, you know, it sounds like luckily you had all this support coming from both, you know, the academic side and the home side. Did you have something that you, were you really idealistic about the idea of I'm going to get into this and work? on creating art at some level as an adult or at that point high school-ish or maybe even early college did you have something that you thought would be your backup no i kind of went all all in yeah. on comics you know i just that, that's the only thing i've ever really been good at or wanted to do you know <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah i i used to draw actually also in high school i would draw these little um like noir detective comics you know yeah like multiple pages nonsense stories you know but <laughs> you know it was fun and it was it was practice you know that's that's the only thing that i tell young kids that want to get into comics is the only way to do it is just to do it just start drawing your comics they, they might be terrible at first or whatever but the more you draw the better you'll get so that's the only way to improve is to just keep doing it yeah yeah <laughs> so, for sure and so you go to scad you you go through that you get your masters did you go straight through to get your masters or did I, you come back i did not have a master's i got oh. a, i got a bachelor's of sequential art a bachelor's of sequential mm -hmm. art right 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 we were talking about teaching earlier and i think i got it flipped mm -hmm. so you got through you got your bachelor's uh and at that point you know you're sending out portfolio links or you know you're showing up at cons and talking to editors and people like that yeah look, yeah um i was I'll, I'll go through my Again, my spiel of how I got into the business okay. for the millionth time. That's okay. No, <laughs> that's right, no, I, no, no. That's I was trying to ask a very pointed, singular there's, question. No, there's, yeah. there's definitely the people that won't. Uh, well, it's, it, 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 it's into that. Because after I yeah. got done with SCAD, I was, at the time, a little burnt out with working real hard. You know, I think that's focused. really common. Yeah, I, I think very, that is really yeah, common. I was very focused to try to, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time, aside from playing video games at a PlayStation, so I played well, <laughs> Final Fantasy and yeah. stuff like that. But uh Outside of that, I basically really focused hard on my uh, schoolwork and got things done like immediately when I get a project, you know, I'd work on it. And I had some, some part-time jobs, but I didn't need too much, so I had I was very fortunate to be able to focus on my work. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, after school, I was a little burnout. I just kind of wandered around for a couple of years, did jobs, you know. Yeah. Um, did you stay in the area at that I point? I did at yeah. first, yeah. I worked on the river boats, and then I moved uh, back to Illinois, mm -hmm. thought about grad school. It didn't definitely wasn't working out. You know, I was like, ah, I'm going to spend all the money for that right, right now. And I went down to Orlando, and I did uh, stay with a friend of mine, luckily, who lived there. He let me crash with him for a while. I, well, first, I worked at Disney World uh, just as a grunt in the park. That sucked. I worked there for about a month, and I quit. Yep. <laughs> and then I worked uh, – I was very fortunate again to um, – my friend worked as a caricature artist at Universal, 
through a, um, through a, a company that was like you know um, what do you call it not licensed but you know a subcontract yeah 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 and uh, so I walked to their offices for a few weeks and and uh, practice getting the, the gist of doing caricatures yeah. and they sent me out of the park it was a great way to learn you know uh, really under pressure uh, to how to break down people's facial structure and, and make you know caricature out of it. Um, I think that has got to be one of the most intimidating and difficult jobs ever is that I'm sitting in front of you now draw me but make it <laughs> funny but don't make me feel bad well, about that's myself. Exactly the, that's exactly the thing. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as they'd sit down almost 95, 99% of people would say the almost exact same thing. Don't make me look you know, or make me look pretty, they'd say. Make me look pretty. I was like, but well, that's not my job. <laughs> yeah, at that point, you know, you really, really couldn't hardly satisfy them. So, no. you know, of course, you'd get some people who'd say, sit down and really mess me up. You know, that'd be great. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was that was a great learning job. Uh, but same kind of thing. You work completely on commission. Yeah. So if there's no customers, you make your money. You're Oof. outside for 12 hours a day in the heat or the rain or whatever. You know, I did that for about four months or so. I was like, forget this. I came back to Savannah. Uh, that's when I started working. It was about oh three. Worked during the day, Parker's downtown. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, stocking their shelves. And I'd go home at night. And my buddy Nate wrote some comics, and I would sit and draw them. Yep. And we took those as you as your question earlier. You know, we would take those around to conventions. You know, we went to like Savannah Blueprint or something, and they would like print them out little eight and a half by eleven ash cans with a color cover for a buck a piece. At yep. the time, it was a great price. You know, I would sell them for two dollars at conventions, and then, the whole point wasn't to really make some money. But just to get out there and show what we're doing, and, you yep. know, that way we could hand a physical book at three of those. So, you know, it's a proof that we knew what we were doing. Yeah. So, uh, was writing shotgun one of those, or was that later? Uh, that was a little, it was at the same time. Okay. Uh, I said, our friend Sophie Campbell, name yeah. drop, you know, she was a good friend of ours at school, and uh, she got that job at Tokyo Pop doing yeah. a book called The Abandoned Zombie Book, and she told her editor, like, go, go look and see what these guys are doing. Yeah. So again, yeah, we had the the work to show, and uh, they let us come up with a pitch. It was kind of half our idea, half theirs, about assassins and stuff. And, yeah. Uh, we worked that up for a month or two, and then we got to work on it. I always thought that was interesting, getting in with, with Tokyo Pop and getting in with something that was a manga format book. And, you know, there aren't, even now, a lot of uh, Japanese publishers that are really looking for Western artists to yeah. do that kind of well, story Tokyo Pop us. is... Is a Western company. Are they? They're, yeah. Initially, their gig was uh, just translating Japanese books right, right, right. in America, and then they yeah. they spun off into their what they called uh, original English language OEM uh, or ma- mangas or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they had a, a line of those of I don't know, probably ten, twenty or so different yeah. books, and it was all just like again we were talking about. It was really just an experiment to try to um, farm IP, yeah. you know, to, to spin it off into other yes. ancillary media, you know. That was the whole point. And one of ours was, you know, ours was one of the more uh, marketable, I guess, you yeah. know, action, gunplay, cars, busty girls, you know, that kind of stuff. Because they did like a Mondo Media, did a little six-minute um, pilot thing. That like an animatic? Trying, that could, yeah, well, it was yeah. an animation. Oh, it was, yeah, cool. You know, and they tried to sell that to, what was it, uh, that man network? I forget what uh, G4 called. or... No, um, anyway... <laughs> Is it one of those cable channels? Yeah. Uh, Spike TV. Ah, yes, that's what nice. It yes, the yes. Man Network. Yes, Spike yes. TV. Uh, so yeah, we didn't like it very much. Cause it was very, <laughs> yeah, way we leaned way into the the sex jokes yeah. and stuff, and it's fine, but that's not exactly what we were going for. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it never went anywhere anyway. So, but it was cool, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's nice that they had that much uh, faith in what we were doing and that it would fly. Um. But again, you know, it, that was a gig where it didn't pay a lot of money, but it was a way to get your foot in the door, you know. It's proof that you could, you know, that you could, hey, I did a book, I did two graphic novels, and the company kind of fell apart before we could do volume three, <laughs> so it never had a real ending. Um, but that is something that's really nice, too. I mean, from a, a, I see it from the retailer side, like, once you've got published work as an artist or as a writer, you're now in all of these searchable databases for retailers to go in and sort and find your work. And I know, especially even now for, for new people who are kind of breaking in, it's kind of, you know, you're in the canon of people who are working and are doing things. And that does make it, you know, that's something. Which it does. Is, yeah. And I'm super fortunate. Like I said, um, again, the little story about um, when we were doing the Tokyo Pop thing, I yeah. just started on that and just barely had a few pages done. 
And, um, you know, I still have them the Steve books and we were at, um, Heroes Con, no, Megacon in 04, I think it was 05. Right? Down in Orlando. Yep. Yes. Um, and I, you know, we were there, had an artist at an alley table that we paid for, but we were selling our stuff. And another fellow that I had, uh, Marlon Shoup, a guy that I knew from SCAD, you know, I was acquainted with him, uh, knew him. He was walking around, he was like at the show, I saw him a few times that weekend, but he kept, happened to come by the table while I was doodling my sketchbook, some Sonic guys, and he's like, oh, hey, that's good. I know the editor, Mike Pellerito on Sonic, and they're looking for new people. That was at the time when Sonic X, the anime show, was on the TV in America. So they were going to do a, you know, a license book of that. So he's looking for new artists to do that. And so that was initially what I had been hired to do, uh, like two book, two issues of that. And he liked what I was doing, so he, got, he let me do two issues of the regular Sonic book. And uh, he liked what, I was, liked what I did. He said, hey, you want to keep doing it? And I said, of course. <laughs> so <laughs> here we are almost 20 years later. And I well, I think that that just really speaks to the overarching get out there, put your work in front of people, talk to people. Mm. In-person connections are hard to beat, you know, even with as easy as it is to get followers on Instagram or to, you know, to put yourself out there digitally. Being able to be in the room with somebody and talk to them mm. has a lot of weight. Yeah, and it's just, you know, it goes to show that you're willing to make that effort. Yeah. You know, that, again, like I said, we did those three issues of Nate and Steve comic book, you know, it was physical proof that we knew what we were doing. We yep. had to we put in the effort to make them. Uh, and then we would go to the shows again. That's where, you know, opportunities, you know, so I always tell kids that are interested in this or whoever, you know, like do the work ahead of time. Don't wait for someone to pay you because not, that's not going to happen. Make your own comics, even if they're not perfect or whatever, but it shows that you know what you're doing or you're willing to try. And, uh, and then you go to conventions and things and, Whenever opportunities come along, you'll have that work to show. So those are kind of the two key things. You know, be prepared and look for opportunities, and be ready for them. Um, and being able to like clearly communicate, not just in the the printed work or the the proposal that you're you know sharing with someone, but being confident enough to to look somebody in the eye, to talk about the thing, to do, like that has again this this additional weight that I feel like it can get really easy to get lost in the kind of ether of, you know, working alone. So much of what you do is solitary or any mm -hmm. artist does is solitary. But being able to, like, shake the hand, look in the eye, oh, I can do that. Let me talk to you about what I do. Yeah, it's nice to be able to to meet an artist and you'll remember them better if you just meet them in person, you know, and mm -hmm. you get their information and, and remember to to call them back and I always tell kids too like if you know if your stuff's not up to snuff uh, you can get a, a bit of a critique maybe and then come back the next year and say hey look I did this this and this and they'll say oh this kid's really serious you know and there's so, value in knowing someone can listen and incorporate feedback and make edits that is yeah. not precious about it yeah exactly it's yeah. work there's a lot of people that won't bend or break or you know, do it you know make yeah. those changes um but yeah, and then again, the other really huge key is like uh, I always, I'm always careful to tell kids you don't. If you can afford to go to a place like SCAD, yeah. do. But don't put yourself into two hundred thousand dollars in debt to do a job that pays you twenty thousand dollars a year. Right. That just doesn't make a lot of sense. Yep. But if you can, you know, if you can get there, take some classes. You don't even have to graduate necessarily. A comic, a degree in comics is worth about the paper it's printed on. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> right. again, unless you want to get a master's degree yeah. and teach, that's teach. a very useful thing, you know. Yeah. Which, you know, it's that's a that's a great avenue if you can afford to do that. Um, but um, you know, making the getting to art school and learning the things that you want to learn uh, is a great uh, thing to do if you can. And, and yeah. nowadays, um, there's a lot of the internet has a, has a huge. Uh, resource that really didn't exist when I was at SCAD. I mean, it did, but not the way it is now. Right. Um, um, but uh, art school, the other main huge thing of that is making those connections with other students. Like I said, I, you know, yeah. without Sophie and without Marlon, I probably wouldn't have a career. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Maybe I would have, but it probably would have taken me a lot longer to, to make that happen. And it's just like any other job, you know. If you know somebody it's inside, all it's in who you yeah, it's a big help. You, know? yeah. you can do it without that, but it's just a lot harder. So yeah. Uh, but again, if I hadn't put in the work, I also never would have got that. So it's a, it's a combination of all those things. Uh, the, really, the from talking to a lot of creators, the downside of getting the work 
is is the grind with doing a monthly book mm -hmm. with with having to churn 22 to 30 pages a month of a title yeah uh and, and getting kind of bogged down in that early on you know you were younger you're hungry you were like you know like you said you're working another job yeah. you're coming home and drawing through the night and mm -hmm. stuff um during that time when you were really involved in that grind mentality of just work 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 what did you do you can you put yourself back in that headspace to kind of remember what the positives were for you then like what did you feel well, like it was the payoff or the 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 good side of that not glorify and grind y'all but I'm just <laughs> well i mean when again it's probably easier when you're younger of course you yeah. have more energy and all that stuff yeah i was saying earlier um i would right after i got sonic i got married and then we started having you know kids and stuff and yeah. uh so i would I, the great thing about freelance it's kind of work is i have a very flexible schedule so if somebody needs to go to the doctor i'm yep. there to do that or you know i cook and dinner and whatnot do things around the house uh, be the, the the home homemaker and all that uh but then you know uh, when you have little kids they require a lot of time which you know great but and i had that time so but then i would work at night same thing you know right. it was like doing double duty for about 10 or 12 years and it just kind of took a big toll on you uh but you know when you're younger you should do some of that you know you shouldn't kill yourself either right. i did it for too long yeah you know but sometimes that's the only way to break in is to you know yeah you might have to do two jobs for a little while uh but don't kill yourself for this or any any job is that they'll just throw you out like you know a broken machine if you can't do it that's just how it is in this career or any you don't they don't feel like they own you anything and you don't owe them anything <laughs> I yeah. think that's important to, yeah, there's a flip side, right? Like, yeah. you know, anybody who works in the in a kind of creative medium, there's this idea that you're easily replaceable. Like, oh, well, there's another kid coming up who can do this well, and they'll do it for less. Because you are. <laughs> yeah, right. But that idea of you, you know, you don't owe them anything. You know, that's that's a hard lesson to learn. And it takes a lot of years under your belt to kind of I mean. get that. Uh, you do in a way. I mean, like I said, I'm all, I'll always be grateful to Mike Pellerito for giving sure. me the chance when he didn't have to. And he kept me on that boat for a lot of years when he could have got somebody else, I guess, theoretically. But I was pumping the work out, so he had no reason to yeah. to look elsewhere. So, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I've had and all the people that have helped me along the way, you know, uh, friends and family and coworkers and whatnot, you know. Yeah. And I do, you do owe gratitude and you do a you know gratitude um, is different than breaking and, your and, back yeah no, exactly. <laughs> but yeah and you, you know if uh, you know there's sometimes if you know, they'll call me up and say hey we need this book tomorrow you know like all right i'll get it done you know yeah but yeah, yeah there's, there's a long there's run. being a good <laughs> steward of someone's uh appreciation and time and money and then there's also work, working yourself into the ground yeah and those are two those are different things and it does take time to to know the difference and yeah. it's not every month. I mean, sometimes you can do that, but not all the time. No, but yeah, there's, like I said, uh, to, to your question earlier about what's good about the grind or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Like just in freelance, just being able to uh, have that flexibility. To be able to do a job you enjoy, even mm -hmm. if it doesn't pay a lot, is worth a lot of money, you know, and being your own boss and, and working on stuff you enjoy. Because like I said, I was, this, I was a big Sonic fan, so drawing yeah. Sonic was a lot of fun, you know? Yeah. And it was for a long time, and I, I, I don't mean to complain currently, but I like I don't enjoy it as much as I used to. It was, uh, things change, companies change, policies change. Sega is a lot more particular than they used to be. Uh, so, you know, I had a lot more creative freedom in the old days to draw characters in kind of my own style and do, like, a lot of facial expressions and stuff that they really probably wouldn't want me to do now. And, you know, um, be a little bit more looser with it, you know? I mean... Yeah, of course, in any IP, it's their toys. you got to play by their rules. It's fine. But, you know, they didn't used to be so specific about uh, the minor details, you know. And now they really, really are. And it's just, you kind of second-guess everything you do. It's like, well, are they going to make me change this, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, got, it's not as fun to do as it used to be. You know? I think that, uh, yeah, when you're working with something that you enjoy and then you realize that it's a business too, and then there is that, that heaviness of, 
oh, they didn't like the thing I did the first time, <laughs> you know, and yeah. I like everything they do. Why don't they like the thing I did on the first time? You but know, I get it. You know, they're, they're not always wrong. I mean, there's definitely some times where like, oh yeah, I didn't notice that or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. I'll make mistakes for sure. And that need to be changed. But then there's like very minor nitpicks. I'm like that's not necessary. But again, it's their, their toys. Yeah. So I got to play by their rules and that's fine. I don't mind doing it. It's just not as much fun to play. <laughs> so, and I, I've all. always loved that analogy of working on licensed property is you're playing with somebody else's toys. Yeah. You know, like you're you're at their house, they've got the toys, you get to play with them, and they get to set the rules on how you play. Yeah. <laughs> so. so, you know, um, yeah, there's big pluses and minuses to all that. The, the big, you know, the other plus is like, you know, maybe... Uh, maybe I don't get to draw things exactly the way I'd like to, but I'm still drawing Sonic. And, like, that's a that's a book that everyone's going to pick up and read, you know. Yeah. It's, got, it's got a lot of eyes on it. It keeps me and, you know, the that sphere, you know, uh, people recognize my work and they know me for it. So, you know, Sonic is a big seller, you know, doing commissions and, and other artwork and stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, like, people want that from me if I was just doing my own uh, self-published work. Nobody would know it. Nobody would want to pay me for it. So... Yeah, it has its you know its real benefits to to doing that kind of uh, that kind of work, I'm working on IPs. Well, you were uh, so kind to us a couple of years ago. We did uh, a sketch cover fundraiser, and Tracy did a couple of covers for us. And uh, one of those is the Iron Man cover, which we still have. And I I love talking to you about working on those because you don't you didn't at that time didn't have a chance to draw a lot of like superhero superhero yeah, yeah. pose. It was just like it was still IP. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> for a publisher or anything. It was for fun. But um, speak to that, like the chance to kind of like get a commission or to be able to like work on something and not not have those same kind of concerns. Oh, it's a lot more fun. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I get a lot of people they want me to draw their Sonic OCs. That's one of the main things I do for commissions. Of which course, is, you know it's it's nice. It's it's difficult sometimes because I want to make sure that I get all the details right and I make their this I think they're baby. So I'm like the same thing. It's like oh, I got to be careful and do this just right. You know. I probably don't need to worry so much, but I, um, you know, I want to give them a good product for their the, the money they paid me and all that. And uh, but it's fun too. It's you know, you get a lot of different designs and things. And then um, it's just doing my own work for fun, which I almost never do all right. the time. <laughs> but it is cool. It's great to work on your own stuff and say, hey, I can do whatever I want. You know, with this piece. <laughs> do you have a, a pet project? Do you just kind of always have in the locker that you're like. Whenever, whenever that mystical day in the future yeah, that I'm going to have maybe. all the time in the world. I've got like a kind of a, a darker, well not dark, but I've got a fantasy yeah. uh, book that I'd like to do, which kind of changes here and there. The, the gist of it is, remains the same. I'd probably like to do something that uh, with it, with like, I would like, ultimately like to do no dialogue whatsoever. You know, like have it all just pantomime comic. That'd be yep. you know, really cool. And then I've got like a, a more fun, probably slightly more marketable um like space action, like what I <clears throat> I would call it, um, what I call it, Guardians of the Galaxy meets um, Fast and Furious sort of thing. But you know, I don't know. Maybe someday yeah. those are both be fun, but there's just a lot of work. Uh, like we said earlier, I, I, <laughs> where's the time? Yeah, it's difficult to do to develop something that might not make you any money at all. I, I don't have the time to do anything that doesn't make me money. So mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> the sad reality of working yeah, for a living, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, if I were to work a, a regular nine to five job, I would probably have more um, energy and more gumption to do art yeah. for fun on my own, you know. But because I do art as my job, mm-hmm. yeah, that uses up all that creative juice to, to do that. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to work on my own stuff, though. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, and I would, even if I had the time, so. Yeah. What is that? You know, I think we all kind of punish ourselves with the things that we're, you know, creative about. It's like, well, I'll do that when I have time, you know, whether no matter what it is, it's kind of that has to take the back burner to to what's right in front of you and needs to get done right away. Yeah. You're only a year behind on your commission. Don't worry. Yeah, about it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do want to make sure if anybody has any questions for, for Tracy, that we have time for that. And mm-hmm. also for the folks that are watching online right now, if you guys have any questions for Tracy, feel free just to add those down in the comments. But if you guys, does anybody have any question? Uh, obviously we could talk about Chris. Go ahead. Brian. Um. So obviously you worked on Archie before moving to IDW and you worked on that for a long time. What um, would you say are like the biggest changes that you've experienced in the time that you started on Archie to now working on IDW? Well, um, not a whole lot. I mean, the companies are not 
terribly dissimilar, I suppose. I don't, I was a little bit more friendly uh, with the editors at Archie. I just had more opportunity to speak to them individually, probably because they had fewer, uh, fewer books to do, you know, a little more time to talk to me directly. I don't, uh, uh, David and Riley are great at IDW. Um, they're really, really nice people, very understanding um, and all that, but I just don't, I don't know them that well. And I, I don't imagine I probably will. <laughs> I don't, I've never met them in person. I don't know when I will live that either. They're all the way in San Diego, so um, it's pretty hard for me to get to that side of the country. I did get a chance to meet Mike and Vin a few times at uh, New York Comic Con and stuff, so that was nice. Um, but as far as the work goes, it's um, the main difference uh, is just the pay schedule and invoicing and stuff like that, you know. Um, and again, as I as I mentioned before, Sega their approval stuff is way more stringent than it used to be. So that's uh, for good or ill. That's just that's how it is now. It's just different, you know. You Do know? you have a favorite con that you've been to? Like you know, one that's merited repeat, you know, trips, oh. and like this is always so good, or well, even just a one off you got to do that you're like that was really nice. Um. Well, as far as like. Um, I used to do Heroes Con yeah. in Charlotte. It's a great show, very comic centered, which mm -hmm. is unusual these days. Yes, but um, before COVID and stuff, the, the attendance and stuff kind of was really falling off there, mm -hmm. even before the pandemic. So um, I haven't been able to go back, and I don't know how it is these days. Um, Mega Con in Orlando is always a good show if you can get there. It's hard to get into that show, very hard, but mm -hmm. it's a great money making show. And Momo Con in uh, Atlanta, mm -hmm. man, that's a great show. That's a, it's a lot of fun. I got a wide variety of stuff. There's all tons of cosplayers. I, it's a good money money making show. It's just a, a great time. So that's probably one of my favorites at MomoCon. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so I was just curious if there was anything like any kind of like movie, show, game, comic, any kind of like media like that that you feel like you go back to a lot, um, just either for inspiration or just for like something to feel good. <laughs> <laughs> just something like that you feel like you always have that you can go back to and just enjoy. No matter oh yeah, what. Star Trek. I love yeah. Star Trek. I, w I would love to work on some Star Trek covers at IDW, okay. but same thing. We've got probably a million people clamoring to do that work. And I, but yeah, I'm currently watching through uh, Deep Space Nine again right now. I about every three or four years or so I, <laughs> I watch through that. I love Deep Space Nine, and I like all of the shows. You know, even you know Voyager, and, uh, and of course Next Generation is is fantastic. And, um, I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of the newer shows. Super Strange New Worlds is okay. It's all right, but um, Lower Decks not your thing. I I really I really enjoy how much they seem to love what they're doing, but I don't I don't love the sense of humor in it. Yeah, and it's really a member berry fest. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, try. It's great. It's fun. It's cool, but it's yeah. also like really try hard and I don't know like, oh. it feels like they're trying hard yeah it's not I don't think it's particularly funny it's it's fun it's fun <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah yeah I really wish they'd just done a a light hearted show instead of a straight up comedy yeah but oh well <laughs> <laughs> great but yeah Star Trek is one of my very favorite things uh, you know that's why I, I, I can watch that all day any day so awesome alright I got a contact for that too I'll send that to you <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, you said something about a noir comic back when you, went, when you were in high school. What did you appreciate about that comic in particular? Cause even <laughs> if it was like bad. Like, oh, it was just fun because uh, I, you know, I don't really know why. I'm not. I didn't really watch a lot of detective stories or read it. It's an stuff. interesting I choice for a high school. Yeah, yeah. Say, like, I just it was just a fun, silly sort of. Um, uh, framework for nonsense stories. You know, I had the detective with his trench coat and hat and stuff. It was uh, it was like an analog of me. It was Ace Trace, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, I like my brothers and, and friends would show up in the comic and stuff, you know. And, uh, yeah, and it was uh, it was cool too because I could do like a you know it was all in black and white. I would use like colored pencils to do gray shading, and then I would have like um, the dialogue blooms. Every issue would be a different color, you know, that would differentiate which issue is which. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> they were usually like eight or ten or twelve pages, you know, whatever on you know like typing paper, and I punch holes and stick them in a binder. You know, I still have them somewhere awesome. in my closet. Yeah. So, but it was just yeah, yeah, it was just fun. Yeah, it was basically I enjoyed drawing. I like 
I like drawing backgrounds and buildings and cars and stuff. So having him in a city, and I like the trench coat and hat style. I used to wear that when I was in high school. I was a huge, giant nerd, you know. So. I was going to say, so like, what would your exposure have been? Like the Dick Tracy movie? Like, what would that have been? I don't think I've ever even seen that. Yeah. But I do. I like the, I like the look of the Dick Tracy comics yeah. and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's just kind of, I don't know. Because at that point in popular culture, you know, You'd see the send-ups in the older cartoons or whatever, but I was trying to think of what would have been concurrent media. To Maybe be really there noir. may have been a little bit of the the Batman animated series. I guess yeah. they had a kind of a noir feel yeah. sometimes, oh, sure. and I was I loved that cartoon when I was in high school or I guess I've been middle school, but yeah, 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 it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> any other questions or anything? No. Quinn, yeah. but I'm glad you're in. <laughs> I'm just glad I got to like, catch the tail end. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. And I'm going to post the whole thing online too. So, yeah, you'll be able to watch it later too. So, yeah, so um, Sonic 900th story in comic mm-hmm. book form. That's pretty crazy. So, yeah, so it's, it, it's, um, it's an amalgamation of all the English language Sonic right. books, so the UK books, all the various American books. Um, uh, you know, I guess they added them all up, and this issue would be the 900th issue to see print. Yeah, across all those separate types, of which movies. is kind of a smart way. We see it in the the regular superhero books too. They'll get creative with their numbering every now and then because yeah. milestone issues are which, they print and more. And it's of. cool because you know they had uh, I how all I really did for it was just the, the cover, which is great. Yeah, I'm thankful to be involved at all. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, and various, the A cover too, which is that's yeah. the one most people are going to get their hands on. Yeah, so. Um, and that's why I thought it was cool that we did that call back to the old print ad from mm-hmm. 1991 or two or whatever. Um, and then, uh, you know, they've got you know, all the different artists, writer and artist teams doing little stories in there. And they've even, because of the UK, they got uh, Richard Elson, one of the old UK artists, to do a cover. I don't know if he did any interiors or not, but he did one of the covers, mm-hmm. one of the harder to find uh, retailer incentive ones, I think. Right. So but that's pretty neat, you know. It's yeah. really cool that they really dug back in history for all that stuff you know (laughs) you've not only had the chance to draw like you said you know all these original characters that people have kind of come up with you've drawn every canon character i would imagine at at one point or another in the books or or through commissions and and all of that uh do you have a character that you're still we'll take sonic out of it but do you have somebody (laughs) that you're like whenever you get to draw a certain character that it's still like okay i'll do something fun with this one yeah, usually, well, Sonic is always fun to draw because he's always doing something kinetic and, fun, and yeah. energetic and all that stuff. So he's, you know, he's just his design has a lot of angles and stuff, you know. He just he just speaks motion, you know, just the look of it. But I mean, generally, anytime I draw anybody, I like to work in a lot of forced perspective type of stuff, you know, into the drawings to make it more fun for me to draw, you know. Which is interesting because they were uh, developed as these two D flat side scroller. I mean, the later characters would have been developed in three D. I, I guess, guess I, yeah. I just like to do that. It's more fun to come up with dynamic poses and things when I'm doing uh, any of the characters. But you know, I mean, I, just as far as like Tails is a, a favorite. And Blaze the Cat is mm-hmm. like kind of almost like Sonic. You know, she's always she looks cool. She's doing cool stuff. So yeah, definitely. Blaze is one of my favorites. <laughs> Had my fingers crossed for Rouge the Bat. Oh, well. Oh, yeah, she's pretty funny. <laughs> she's yeah, she's pretty good. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in your process. So, mm-hmm. like, going from, like, thumbnails to inking and stuff. Like, how how does that look for you? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And that's funny. And that brings up a good point, too. Because, like, in, the, uh, in Archie days, like I said, I used to do almost all just pencils. Uh, except the covers. I would do, occasionally do inks and also occasionally colors on, on the covers for Archie, but it's mostly just pencils. So, um, you, you know, most of the time I'll actually print out a script that I get on the paper and I'll just, I'll do the little thumbnails on the page. So that was as I'm reading and I can just, you know, do like a little super basic uh, sketch of what the page might look like, you know, blocking out the panel shapes and the word balloons and character actions and stuff. And then um, nowadays, um, I, in 2018, when, I, when the new book started, and when I did the Cosmo, yeah. the Cosmo for Archie was actually the first time I did a digital uh, comics. Oh, really? um, yeah. So I got, got an iPad and I used a program called Comic Draw, um, <clears throat> which is not particularly um, sophisticated, but it, it's really it's really great for comics. It doesn't yeah. have all the bells and whistles like Clip Studio or something like that. I don't need all that stuff. So um, um, yeah, now I you know. I rarely ever draw anything physical. Occasionally, I do covers, 
or commission art sometimes I'll do physical, but I work on the iPad now. And uh, so sometimes, you know, I'll still, sometimes I'll do my thumbnails on, you know, a Word document or whatever, and I'll just draw it on there. Or occasionally I'll print it out and do it the old way, but then I'll usually like take a screenshot of that thumb, I'll blow it up and layer it on the page and then just drop it down on like 5% opacity. So I can kind of see it and then I'll work on it, you know, and I'll change it up if I need to, but I have like that, yeah, that little thumbnail template right on the page to work with. So yeah, working with layers is, is really great uh, for fit to digital art, you know. Um, it's a scalable light table. Like yeah, table. like I can, my eyes are real bad, so I can zoom in real far and uh, there's pluses and minuses because when you're working on pencil, uh, I, it still has a, a better feel. You know, it just feels more real to do that. But it's also a little more difficult, you know, because you got to erase and you got to, you know, you got to take a little more care to plot everything out. Um, I don't think I've ever had to scrap a page ever. Like one time, I did, I had like a, a, a splash page of Sonic X. And our cat knocked my drink on it, <laughs> but but it went it went so um, uniformly over the page that as soon as it dried, you really couldn't tell. So I think, Woo. <laughs> yeah, but um, <clears throat> yeah, but yeah, when I'm working on pencil, you know, I, I, a lot of times I have to erase and change things and stuff, and so uh, and I was when I would work on pencils and paper, it would be a little more loose, I guess. Not uh, not to say. Like the, I would keep my pencils pretty tight and clean and finished, but uh, my drawing style used to be a little more loose. Now that I work on the iPad, it's just a little different, and my style's a little different, and IDW, you know, the look and what they demand out of us is a little more different, you know, so I'm, I take a little more time, and because I can layer things and do, I was like, ooh, now I can, uh, I can add all these effects and stuff, you know, and you, you kind of have to stop yourself from doing too much on the page, you know, because you have all these options, you know. I generally stick to just my regular brush, and I'll have, like, a, a couple zip tone brushes, and, like, I got a rough brush for, like, smoke effects and stuff. I kind of limit it to just that stuff, you know, so I don't go overboard. But even then, you know, like, um, yeah, doing, like, really complicated scenes and stuff is easier because you can layer things and not have to erase and, you know, you can resize and just flip it and you know, shape it and stuff and all that. And you can, like, yeah, physically flip the screen and make sure nothing looks all wonky because, you know, like, my, I have that thing where I look out of this eye, so a lot of my stuff gets skewed and I don't notice it until later. <laughs> so, um, Well, I love that idea of limiting the tools that you're using, even if it's subconsciously or, you know, you're not actually modifying your workspace maybe, but you're like, okay, well, because that does add a lot more uniformity and consistency to a look because like you said, you have all these toys, you have all these brushes you could choose from, all these effects you could drop in. Yeah, this, I've seen a lot of people that do um, digital pencil and or ink when they have the gray scale on the inks and I'm like, mm -hmm. how does that work for colors? I've never really understood that personally. Yeah. I'm sure I'm sure it's fine, but uh, yeah, I just limit myself to zip tone, just pure black and white pixels. I don't. I can make sure that my art is nice and clean for the colorist. If they want to uh, anti-alias or whatever, that's fine. They can, but yeah. I, I try to give them the cleanest art I can to work with. So yeah, there's like there's big pluses and minuses. I think there's more pros to working digitally than cons for sure. Um, the speed of which just sounds like it's yeah, yeah, in a lot of ways. Like I guess you should use it. Take me like four, five, six hours to do a pencil page, and it probably takes me. You know, I don't even know eight or ten to do a fully inked page digital. It's right. not as much. It's not as much time. But I also don't. Nobody has to scan that in or anything. It's done. I just email it to them. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. You know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it does probably saves a lot of production time to not have to scan and I have to clean up. I know for covers for sure. That's a, a bane. Well, you was the bane of my existence. I scan in a cover and then go into Photoshop and I clean all the little, you know, little smudges and things and yeah and. You do the threshold and all that stuff. So, yeah, digital, but the, the big, huge downside to doing digital art is you don't have any originals to sell. So. And with something like with a fandom like this and you know, your reputation over the years as being one of the preeminent artists of the franchise, of yeah, I could see that being, a like, especially for covers, but any any of your work at this point, really, would be, hey, it's the real thing. Yeah. It's one of these. It's yeah, one unfortunately, one. I sold all my you know physical pages long ago, yeah. uh, collectors for way less than I probably could, should have, but I, you know, have, I have kids and I, need, I always need money, so, yep. 
Yeah, if I'd have hung on to them, they'd be worth a lot more now, but yeah. it is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> easy come, easy go. Where do you stay on chili dogs? Is that like I number love chili one dogs. food? Okay, got yeah. it. <laughs> I'm here with all the hard hitting Sonic. That's not questions. my favorite, but I do. Here's the bag, chili yeah, dogs. What and else yes, do I know about Sonic? It probably is because of Sonic that I try. <laughs> sure. I love it. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Well, yeah, buddy. Having kids, are they like super hyped that you draw Sonic stuff or not really? Not really. I mean, they, 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 it's cool. I mean, they, they like Sonic fine, you know. And it's they love to go to conventions and stuff. And they love to. Mm-hmm. To, you know, get in for everybody and, and go behind the scenes and things like that. So they like to, you know, buy things, of course. <laughs> yeah, trust me that as soon as dad does something he thinks is cool, it stops being cool immediately. <laughs> immediately, sadly. <laughs> um, I want to, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, piggybacking off of like when you were talking about your process, mm. do you feel like now that you've been doing it, um, for like quite a while, do you feel like you still have to warm up to kind of like, like that kind of mindset where it's like you use it or you lose it, you know? Probably. I mean, I don't really do warm ups per se, but I, uh, I'm like, I'm just definitely, it's, it's a lot more difficult to get going nowadays. I don't know if it's, you know, maybe ADHD or something. I, I wouldn't be surprised if I had some kind of low level yeah. on the spectrum or not. I don't know, but I just do not have the, I do not have the drive that I used to, and I, it's just really hard to make myself do it, and it take I get distracted a lot easier. You know, yeah. When I was a kid, you know, in my twenties and even thirties, and I could just I could run through these. You know, I'd sit eight, twelve hours a day, just draw, you know, no problem at all. But I can't do that anymore. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that's all. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So chili dogs, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to thank Tracy again for being here. Um, if you guys could give a quick round of applause. Uh, we are so lucky to have so many amazing uh, working artists and artists that are uh, at different stages on their journey in this town. And so, you know, there are a lot of artists that are here in the room tonight, which I think is great. It's always nice to hear another artist talk about process or business experience or their career path. But uh, for even those of you that aren't artists and aren't already involved in the scene, I highly encourage you to, since you love this stuff, I hope you love it, you're here, that's all good stuff. Um, do, you know, come show up at all these events that we have or that our neighbors have, get involved in the local comics community in a way that feels good and authentic to you and support the folks who make this stuff. Because, you know, sadly, we, we all think that everybody who gets to do this amazing work should be paid and compensated in a way that uh, is uh, measurable to, to the impact it makes on us. But sadly, it's not always the case. And so the best way to do that is to, you know, supporting the artists directly, uh, whether they're at a show or a con or have a website or, you know, or anything where you're able to interact with the artist directly, that's always the best way to do it. And second best was to buy their work. So when it's coming out through a publisher, making sure that those covers sell really well and, and that way the publisher knows to go back and that there's an audience for that artist and everything. So thank you again, Tracy. Thank Always a pleasure well. to have you. And uh, thank you to everybody for coming out tonight. Um, we'll stay open for a little longer uh, if you guys want to browse or whatever. But uh, so no rush getting out. And if you guys haven't had a chance to talk to Tracy yet, um, feel free to, to bother him for a few yep. minutes before he drives home. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys.